we we you know we have uh, gotten really good feedback on you from from various people that that we know in L.A. Listen, that's, that, did they say I was handsome? <laughs> This is the first phone call between filmmaker Andrew Jarecki and L.A. Assistant District Attorney John Lewin. They would go on to have a long relationship with each other, both playing a key role in what would happen to Robert Durst. But in this never-before-heard call from early 2013, you can hear they're still trying to figure each other out. It sounds like you guys did an investigation that it may be better than what was done originally by either any of the departments involved. It kind of starts and ends with you guys. What are you willing to let to let us see? Yeah, I mean, in this particular case, especially, it's just all we want to do is share stuff in a smart way. Hi, I'm Zach Stewart Pontier, one of the filmmakers behind HBO's The Jinx. Welcome to a very special episode of the official Jenks podcast called The Filmmakers and the Murderer. Part two of the Jinx airs this Sunday night, April 21st on Max. But before we get to that, today on the show, we're pulling back the curtain and the conundrum we faced, who to trust with the evidence that pointed to Bob's guilt. Plus, the story of how we found that shocking bathroom confession. It's the end of 2012. I'm working out of a closet of an editing room in New York, watching and re-watching Andrew's second interview with Bob. So you wrote one of these, but you didn't write the other one. I wrote this one, but I did not write the good album one. And can you tell me which one you didn't write? No. In the next room over, producer Mark Smerling is on the phone with our legal consultant, Marsha Clark the former O.J. Simpson prosecutor, talking about what we should do next. This call, like many you'll hear in this episode, is recorded. We record everything. I mean, the big issue for us right now, Marsha, is that we have stuff that they want, and when do we give it to them, and under what what agreement, because we still want to retain our journalistic privilege, and we want to, you know, we want to make a movie. Yeah, that's the problem. You know, the general public probably thinks that, well, if you have evidence of murder, it's automatic, right? The police have to prosecute. The district attorney has to bring a case. But that's not the case at all. It's much more unpredictable than that. Andrew wants to make sure that we're turning over the evidence to the right agency. And through a contact, Mark gets connected to someone at the FBI. Hello? Is this Mark Sperling? It is. Oh, hey, ma'am, Mark, this is uh, Eric Perry with the FBI. In this conversation with Special Agent Eric Perry, Mark wants to carefully float the idea that he and Andrew have discovered some new evidence. There's no doubt that both of us are in the place where, you know, we firmly believe, and I, I would, I would, beg you to keep this to yourself. Yeah. I mean, we firmly believe he's guilty of these crimes, and we found stuff that we're like, oh, God. Back in the office, Andrew and Mark discuss how much faith to put into their upcoming meeting with Agent Perry. The FBI is in a position to do a proper job here. Right. Not that they can't, but they, they haven't. Right. That's why I'm saying he's got to give us confidence yeah, He's bringing somebody. He said he might bring somebody, which is the kind of thing you say if you're not going to bring somebody, but you want other people to think that you have other people involved. So Andrew and Mark have the meeting with Agent Perry. He actually does bring somebody. Yeah, hold, hold, hold on a second. I'm going to put you on the street. Come on. Eric, you there? Yes, I am. Somehow, Agent Perry knows about that letter. Susan Berman's adopted stepson, Sarah Kaufman, gave us. You have a letter that is locked up in your safe <laughs> for safekeeping. Well, we have, I mean, uh, we have a ton of stuff. And, uh... Yeah. But, um, there's something like that that would exist that would probably be huge because we might present, we might try and get a, uh, another DA on board out here. 
Agent Perry says there's a prosecutor in L.A. who might be interested in bringing a case against Bob for the murder of Susan Berman. We check back in with our legal consultant, Marsha Clark. Hello? Hey, Marsha. Hello. Hey, it's me, Mark. Is Mark there? Yeah, I'm here. The prosecutor's name? John Lewin. He's somewhat of an icon in the L.A. Major Crimes Division, known for solving cold cases. John Lewin is really good. He's your perfect guy for this kind of thing. He does a lot of cold case work. Um, and he is somebody who's good at pulling together circumstantial evidence cases. L.A. County Deputy District Attorney John Lewin has spent decades prosecuting complicated circumstantial murder cases. And we're back to that call from the top of the show. Andrew and Mark talking to John Lewin for the first time. Okay, he's here. Who do we got? And Andrew and Mark. <laughs> oh, okay. Hey. Oh, I, I, there's about 27 of us on the phone here. Is that right? <laughs> Lewin gets right to it. My goal is, I'm looking at this thing. Okay, can we build a case? How do we build a case? The best thing that can happen to me when I'm looking at an old case is to have new evidence. So that's where you guys come in. The key to this is probably going to be those videotapes of Bob. A few weeks later, Andrew and Mark fly out to L.A. to show John Lewin and his team some of our footage. Specifically, Andrew's first interview with Bob Durst. Where are we going? We're going over there. See that big building? Angeles. That's the Los Angeles Homicide Central. All right, so we're going to see John Lewin, who's the assistant. He's an assistant district attorney <clears throat> in the city of Los Angeles. The conference room is packed full of assistants and prosecutors, all eyes glued to the screen, watching what Bob's going to say next. That was an argument. Was that argument just a verbal argument? No, that was a pushing, shoving argument. That's the first time I ever heard that. You can hear it in John's voice. He's legitimately surprised and intrigued. When I heard that our main witnesses were going to be filmmakers, I was very apprehensive at first. This is Habib Balian, Lewin's second in command. John said, look, I've met these guys. Um, they're good guys. They have good intentions. They're going to give us the stuff. Just trust me. But at the same sense, I could kind of feel you kind of like sizing us up, like watching our reactions, like, oh, can I trust these guys? Habib's actually not far off. Here's a late night meeting between Andrew and Mark. It's just the minute that they their person has it, they own it. Yeah. They're not going to be like, okay, here's your evidence back that's crucial. Well, why, at some point, we're not going to need it anymore. I mean, we don't really trust them to do it at this stage, but if we can hold their feet to the fire and we can say, look, we have this evidence, we're going to show you this evidence, we're not going to give it to you, you can arrest me if you want, but, and let's see whether you guys are serious. By this point, the jinx has still not come out. Here's Andrew on the phone with his legal team, briefing them on what the relationship with the LADA's office will look like moving forward. We were in LA for uh, three or four days, meeting with the members of the district attorney's office. He said since the beginning, can't trust that if you hand us stuff, somehow it's gonna keep completely silent because you know, as soon as multiple people find out about it, it will be known that there is evidence. It will be known that we have met with you guys. We're trying to balance both making a film and providing evidence in a murder case. That's not gonna slow us down. We're not waiting for something to happen. You know, because we make the revelation that Bob is guilty, and that's where the movie ends. It was a delicate dance. Many smart people, lots of moving parts, and eventually a subpoena. Mark talked about this in 2015 in an unreleased interview. As a filmmaker, if you continue to make your film and you have this evidence, people are going to criticize you. If you hand it over right away and you don't do the right thing by the film, people are going to criticize you. 
But we always knew that the letter had to be turned over to law enforcement. That was the right thing to do. At the time, Mark called Andrew to talk about the logistics of turning over the letter. Uh, Lewin just called me, and he wants to know if we're still coming. That means you should probably pull said thing from said box. Later that day, Andrew went across Madison Avenue to the basement of the J.P. Morgan Bank and unlocked the safe deposit box where we were keeping the letter. Appears to be just as it was left. They're very confident that, you know, we found enough. They've asked us to bring them the original material, which we were somewhat hesitant to do because we wanted to make sure that they were fully committed. I knew you were going to give me the stuff. This is John Lewin in an interview for part two of The Jinx. I remember telling you, listen, I generally work on the cases, you're going to remember this, five to ten years before I file them. A and you were literally just horrified. Lewin starts to build his case against Robert Durst, and we go back to the edit room of The Jinx, where we would soon make a crucial discovery. We bring on Shelby Siegel, a new editor. We give her an assignment, watch all of the Bob interviews to see if there's any last footage we should add into the show. Eventually, she gets to the very end of the second interview with Bob. I still remember my heart racing and taking out the, the letter and walking him through it. And I'm just on the edge of my seat. And as I'm watching it, the camera that I'm watching cuts off. And right when it cuts off, the audio continues. And then um, I hear the door open. And then I hear, There it is, you're caught. There it is, you're caught. And I just scream. Shelby runs over to find me. And here I am telling the story back in 2015. It was amazing. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. You got to hear this. There it is. You're caught. And I'm like, wow. Like, I couldn't believe it. It, would be, it was so cool in a way because it had sort of been there the whole time. Here's me and Mark calling Andrew to tell him what we found. Hey. 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 The big, big, big news over here. What's going on? Uh, Jack, tell, uh, tell Andrew what you just told me. Shelby um, was watching through the Bob interview again. So she got to the... Um, very end of the day. I'm like packing up a sandwich for him. He's going to take it with him to go. He goes into the bathroom and he's still got his mic on. And the door closes and it's like the first moment he has by himself. And he says to himself, there it is. You're caught. Andrew. <laughs> Andrew, are you on the ground? That's amazing. <laughs> I remember oh, incredible. That. I remember that. I remember that he went into the bathroom. Yeah, I remember that, too. He was in there for too. a little bit. The, the, whole, the whole idea of, you know, that we've been talking about this film as, as a confession, and it's always been figurative, now it's literal. Yeah. Now it's a literal confession. How do we just find that? So the interview was over. Bob was still wearing his microphone, Andrew still wearing his microphone, and the sound still being recorded. But we're all buzzing about in a loud room as Bob gets up and goes into the bathroom. So Bob's in there and he's talking to himself really quietly. And the two of their microphones are smashed together on different tracks, but in the same recording. Here's what that audio sounds like. This is why I said to you, you're going to continue to have a relationship. And I knew this was going to happen. And I think if I had pressed any... No, no, there's nowhere else to go. Once Andrew's audio got turned off, then we could hear just Bob by himself in the bathroom. Here's Shelby picking up the story. So at that point, we all cram into this little edit room that was at the back, 
Um, and we were looking at the monitor and we see the waveforms and we're just listening to this audio. And you know, it's like the very small room and there's like probably seven or eight of us all. Everybody's just like, hey, what's he gonna say in this bathroom? We're all huddled together around the laptop, trying to figure out what Bob's saying. Let's pick it apart. Right, of course. You're right, of course. Can't imagine. Can't imagine. And then it just gets farther, he's farther and farther and farther, and then... Kill them all, of course. That, there's no way. Like, there's no way that that he just said that. It's like, kill them all, of course. You're like, I can't believe it. When he said, kill them all, of course, I mean, again, we, we screamed. I'm pretty sure I squeezed Zach's hand. Like, it was, it was incredible. It felt like, I mean, it felt like, we, it, it was impossible that that's what he was saying. And I always imagine, like, that he's looking at himself, that he's standing there in, in the bathroom. He's just, like, washed his hands. He splashed water on his face. And he's, like, looking at himself. And he's saying that to himself. It's, like, a powerful thing. I mean, he's, like, looks at himself in the mirror and says, you're a murderer. Question, Andrew. What do we do about Lewin? And just a few weeks later, L.A. Assistant District Attorney John Lewin is in New York City with the rest of his team. Habib and I and Liz and George had come to New York to do work on the case. The case was not filed yet, so we were being very low profile. We had decided we could interview. These people are far enough away from Bob's world. Andrew calls Lewin and invites him over to the edit room, telling him that we have something new we want to show him. Here's Prosecutor Habib Balian again. We remember going up to your office and sitting in there, and, and the computers were up, and somebody hit play, and we listened to it. If that was a movie, bullshit. But it happened. I remember personally thinking the... The first statement he made when he went in there, before the door even shut, there it is, you're caught, to me was more telling than killed them all, of course. To me, there it is, you're caught, really said everything. Habib said that Lewin did not want to leave New York without the bathroom audio. I pulled John aside, and we agreed, one way or another, we had to leave New York with that audio in hand. Like, literally, our cab was showing up to go to the airport, and he was still halfway through downloading whatever he had to download in terms of the audio with the detective. And we got to the airport thinking, John's not going to make this flight, but he'll come home eventually with that audio. John just makes it onto that plane. But back in LA, Habib and the rest of the team, they have some questions. I remember that day thinking to myself and actually discussing it with John after the fact is when did they actually know about this bathroom audio? Because clearly this was taped a long time prior to our involvement. And here we are at a much later point in time after they've given us all this other stuff. And now we get this bathroom audio. And, and why was there that delay? Lewin and his team come back to New York to get Andrew, Mark, and me to give recorded statements and explain how we found the evidence, especially that bathroom audio. Okay, uh, and do you mind if I call you Zach? Not at all. Okay, uh, Zach, um, briefly... So here I am, in a law office in New York, sitting across from the prosecutors, a little freaked out. One of those editors started re-watching the raw footage again and noticed Bob saying, there it is, you're caught, as he was heading into the bathroom. 
you mentioned it, Eric. Do you remember this person's name? Shelby Siegel. He looks much more confident on the Shelby than he does the Siegel. Yeah. We then interviewed all the, the players, and we interviewed Shelby, and we interviewed everyone else, and we came to realize, oh, it really was just an oversight. Some things just do get missed, right? The making of a film is a very complicated process, it turns out. In the months since Andrew's second interview with Bob, he's been a free man. Andrew and him have kept in touch, stayed friendly, but Bob was out there in the world being Bob. And even though we knew he was unpredictable, we never would have predicted this. The video hasn't been made public until tonight. It shows Robert Durst at the pharmacy picking up a prescription. He's at the front checkout counter and Durst bends down for some reason and then, without warning, stands up and starts peeing on the candy in front of the register. It's almost impossible to believe this is true. I mean, it really is insane. As you can imagine, local news outlets have a field day with this story. A customer sent us a photo at the cleaned out space after millionaire Robert Durst allegedly urinated on them. Why did he do that? That's the question. It's crazy. But Chip Lewis, Bob's attorney at the time, said there was a legitimate reason. A medical mishap. Plain and simple, he had to go and he couldn't hold it. In the end, Bob pleaded no contest to criminal mischief. He posted a $5,000 bond and was quickly freed. Andrew and Charles Bagley, a New York Times reporter who's followed Bob for years, talked through his arrest and Bob's history of urinating in strange places. So we were just talking about where these peeing, just how fucking weird that was. It's just one pissing contest after another. Uh, he was a, an Olympic level pisser. Andrew was even in touch with Bob at this time. The two of them spoke about it in the lead up to the jinx. I mean, this urinating thing, it's total coincidence. Around the same time, Bob's brother Douglas had been quoted in the New York Times saying that Bob had peed in his wastebasket when they were working together. Bob told Andrew it was actually much worse. Me and three or four of the other disaffected people um, we're peeing in a sushi. We would have family lunch meetings once a month. And the folk would usually arrive on 11 in the morning. And in the meantime, all the food sat in the kitchen until it was time for the meetings. And I found out that some of the people were peeing in the sushi. So I started peeing in the sushi too. This was a really fancy, good sushi place. You'd think they'd realize that it was swimming in peace. Andrew's face during this moment is kind of priceless. It's a mix of absolute horror and sheer delight. Hi, okay. Thanks for calling me, Bye-bye. Always interesting. All this is happening just months before the premiere of The Jinx Part 1 in early 2015. After P-Gate, Bob settles back into his life in Houston, unaware that the authorities are on his tail. We had been part, you know, planning and part good luck. Uh, they didn't know anything about our reinvestigation. We had managed to keep it hidden for two years. Once The Jinx comes out, Lewin knows the clock is ticking. Our problem was we were concerned he was going to flee. Lewin is right. Um, I am at the J.W. Marriott Hotel in New Orleans under the name of Ward, W-A-R-D. Bye-bye. Find out what happens next on The Jinx Part 2, premiering this Sunday, April 21st on Max. The official Jinx podcast is hosted by me, Zach Stewart Pontier. It's produced by ZSP Media and Hit the Ground Running Films with HBO. This episode was produced by Ramoy Phillip and Ethan Oberman. The rest of our team is Naomi Bronner and Laura Newcomb. 
The supervising producer is Liz Stiles. This episode was edited by Simone Polanin. Mixing and engineering by Zach Schmidt. It was recorded by Brett Tubin and Brendan Dalton at Relic Room in New York City and Bree Corey at Slap Studios in Los Angeles. Music by Wes Dylan Thordson. Additional music courtesy of HBO. The executive producers are Andrew Jarecki and me, Zach Stewart Pontier. Special thanks to Michael Gluckstadt, Ali Cohen, Aaron Kelly, and Savon Slater at HBO Podcasts. And the fabulous Jinx team, Sam Neve, Kyle Martin, Charlotte Kaufman, Richard Hankin, Susan Lazarus, Annabelle White, Pedro Vital, Jesse Herman, Michele Zibarfian, and Nako Narder. And thanks to Roe Dillon, George Vogel, Charlie Wessler, Nancy Jarecki, and Emily Wiedemann. And you, thank you for listening and making it all the way through the credits. Here's some more from that first phone call between Andrew Jarecki and John Lewin. And, um, you know, and hopefully we'll get a chance to sit, sit across the table from each other so we're not always on a, on a phone that's being tapped by Bob Durst in preparation for the upcoming murders. I want to say right now, if Bob listening, I've had very little involvement in this thing, Bob, and as far as I'm concerned, I don't even know if you're involved in this thing. That's the, see, that's the, kind of, that's the thing that gives us the confidence to know that we're the, we're the right guy.